first reading this morning is taken from 1 Kings 8, verses 1 to 6, followed by verses 10 and 11. For those who have church Bibles, it can be found on page 344. Page 344. Then King Solomon summoned into his presence at Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the Israelite families to bring up the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Zion, the city of David. All the men of Israel came together to King Solomon at the time of the festival in the month of the Ithiam, the seventh month. When all the elders of Israel had arrived, the priests took up the ark, and though they brought up the ark of the Lord, and then the, ten, the tent of meetings, and all the sacred furnishings in it, the priests and the Levites carried out them up, and King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel that had gathered about him were before the ark sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded and counted. The priests then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and all the priests could do not could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of God had filled this temple. The second reading is from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. That's uh, page 1177 in the Church Bibles. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and, and in his mighty power. Put on his full armor of God so that you, are, you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the power of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heaven's realms. The third reading is from John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse uh, 56 to 69. That's page 1071 in the Church Bible. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who, t who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many disciples said Jesus. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offer you, that, does this offend you, sorry? What, is, what if you see the sun of men ascend to where he, he was before. The sp spirit gives lives, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you and spirit, and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had, had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. 
From this time, many of the disciples turned back and no, no longer followed him. You do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And that is the word of the Lord. So I just want to welcome Jackie up. Can I pray for you? Yes, please. <laughs> Father God, thank you for Jackie. Thank you of the woman that you've got, um, of God that you have created. And I pray that she will share um, a message that is sent from you, Lord, today to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. Um... Praise God. Praise God that he's in control because um, some of the verses I read and prepared are different to what we heard. Praise God. He has a message for us. I bet Madonna doesn't have this problem, does she? I think it, it's really relevant that the, the thing I'm going to focus on this morning is the armor of God. And um, I sat there feeling really confused and I thought, no, not having it. God is in control. Satan brings confusion. And, um, you know, it, it's really important that we hold on to that truth. But I'm going to start where um, we started in the reading from Kings because um, the book of Kings. Um, chapter 8 is where Solomon has built the temple and is dedicating not only the temple, if you actually read the whole chapter, he is rededicating the people of Israel to God Father God the Lord God of Israel and um, in the, the beginning of the chapter it says that they were, they were sacrificing so many sacrifices to God that you couldn't count them they were serious. This was a serious business. They really wanted to be connected back to God. Now, it was David, Solomon's father, who had had a heart to build a permanent temple to house the name of the Lord. But God had told him that it wouldn't be him, as admirable as that was, to have the desire of his heart to want to build the temple. It wouldn't be him. It would be his son who would actually fulfill that that dream of his and I think that very often we may get a vision for something we may have a heart for something and we might even start the ball rolling but we may not be the ones to finish it and there may be a whole chain of events that brings something into being for example um, if you think about the the charity in Luton that is now Noah Enterprise for example that started with a soup kitchen down by the park near the town centre way back in the day just giving soup and sandwiches to the homeless and the prostitutes that were around the area at the time. And out of that, that one person's vision grew into what we now know as Noah Enterprises and all the fantastic work they're doing. But we can't do all this stuff on our own. It, you know, we can have a vision, but we also have to hold on to things lightly because God's vision may be, yes, that's a great idea, and yes, you can have the passion for it, but you may not necessarily see that to fulfillment. And it's about his agenda, not ours. And that is really important. So God's presence among his people had been very visible. He had been among his people. They had had the Ark of the Covenant in a tent, uh, a portable temple, if you like, almost. Um, and now finally, um, there is a, uh, a permanent structure. But God had resisted that for nearly 500 years since the people of Israel were led out of Egypt, it was nearly 500 years later before the temple was actually built. And Solomon voices within his dedication in verse 27 something that um, is really quite profound and really struck me when I was reading this chapter. And it says, but can God really dwell on earth? Can God really dwell on earth? The heavens even the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less 
this temple I have built. Sorry. My chubby cheeks. Sorry. But can God really dwell on earth? We know the answer to that, of course, because we know that much later Jesus came and fulfilled that. But Solomon, 500 years after the people of Israel are brought out of Egypt, questions, can you really dwell on earth? You're massive, you're huge. You, you know, the heavens can't contain you, so how can you do this? It really is quite a profound statement. How amazing then is it that a God who can't be contained by the heavens would come personally, live among us as a man, and then die the most painful of deaths to be with his people, not just with us, but within us through his spirit. So this God of the universe that cannot be contained is within each one of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. How awesome is that? If you came here tired this morning, just contemplate that. How special are you to be the temple of God? Yeah? It's not about bricks and mortar. So as I've said, Solomon dedicates the temple. He rededicates Israel, the chosen people. And later in the chapter, if you read it, and it is a long chapter, he references how Israel will actually sin against God, how they would turn away from him, and the consequence would be that God would actually allow them to, to go their own way for a while and be defeated, you know, um, suffer tremendous, tremendous losses, be overrun. Um, and in their desperation, that they would call out to God in repentance and he would restore them, um, which is really, really powerful. And he also references the fact, and I think it's in verse 43, I didn't write it down here, um, that those who are not of Israel but foreigners would come to know the Lord. Now, that doesn't happen till much, much later on because the Israelites you know, were so consumed with themselves and the fact they were the chosen people um, and doing their own thing that they actually missed that opportunity at that time. But it was always God's intention that the Israelites, the people of God, would be a light to all nations. Um, and we, as the people of God today, who are grafted in as Gentiles, most of us here, I think, um, we are grafted in to actually be the light to the nations. And that's really important, particularly in the world that we see today and everything that's going on. So that I just really wanted to highlight that because I just think it's a really fascinating story. And if you get the chance, take the time to read it and see what God says to you. Because what he said to me, he may not say to you, but it, it really does open your mind sometimes when you just read scripture and you think, well, that means nothing to me. If it means nothing, read it again and again. And it may be one verse, like the one verse that I picked out there, verse 27, that just jumps off the page and you go, that is amazing. How incredible is that? So I'm going to move on to um, Ephesians and the section on the armor of God. Now, I don't want you to think that I don't take um, preparation for talks seriously. So I want you to see I did a little stick man. That's where I started. If anybody would like a copy of my stick man drawing, um, I'll sign you one later. Um, <laughs> It, it helps me to be visual when I'm trying to contemplate what God is trying to say. So it's the armor of God. So I started with a stick man. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read the whole of um, Ephesians 6 from 10 to 20. So, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, 
and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So the armor of God. If we think back to Jesus time um, and when Paul wrote this to the Ephesians their examples of armor would be Roman soldiers and we've all seen them in the films you know they're all very majestic and usually have their red tunics I don't think I've ever seen a different color but they're usually red um, and they have shiny breastplates and big helmets and spears and swords and massive shields so if you've got that picture in your mind that's what Paul is trying to demonstrate here So I think it's no mistake that the belt of truth comes first. Because if you're not telling the truth, you're telling a lie. And if you're not believing the truth, you're believing a lie. There is no such thing as a white lie. A lie is a lie. Sin is sin. A lie is a lie. And if you want to know the truth about a situation... And we often don't do this as human beings because we like to fill in the gaps ourselves. If you want to know the truth about a situation because you've heard half a truth, go and ask the question rather than make it up. Jesus says in John, in chapter 8, he says, uh, you shall know the truth and it will set you free. He doesn't say, you shall know the truth and you'll like it. Has anyone ever told you a truth that was really painful to hear? Yeah? But there is something in standing in truth. If you know something isn't quite right, somebody has said something to you and you think it's not quite right, it makes you uneasy, doesn't it? When you get to the truth of that situation, actually, it is very freeing. It releases you. You may not like it, but from a position of truth... You're in the light. You've brought it into light. What's in the darkness is now in the light. It's truth. It's out there. It's a very hard thing for us to do. We naturally tend to hide things, things that make people uncomfortable. We hide. But I think it's so important that truth comes first here. And Jesus says later in in chapter 8, he's been talking to some Jews, and they've been debating about what it is to be a real disciple, what it is to be a, a true child of God. And they're talking about, well, we're children of Abraham. And he's saying, but if you don't believe in me, you're not children of God. You'll believe in something different. You know, here I am. I'm the truth. He, he says later in, I think it's chapter um, 16 or something, 14 maybe, he says, I am the truth, the life, and the the way. I, I'm all these things. I am the answer. It doesn't matter what the question is. I am the answer. Jesus is the answer. He is the truth. He is the only truth we need to know. And we can measure every situation and every circumstance we find ourselves in against the um, example that Jesus sets us. That isn't easy, but we can do it. He is our example. He was perfect, is perfect, remains perfect, will always be perfect. And we will never be that. But we can become imitations with flaws. We're not flawless. But one day we'll be with him in glory. Amen. Are we holding on to the truth? There's a question for you. So the belt of truth. Then comes the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the the breastplate in the uh, armor of a Roman soldier was to protect all the vital organs. It was probably very heavy, but it was essential because obviously they didn't use um, 
rifles and that kind of thing. It, it was one-on-one -on -one combat very often, so they had to protect all their vital organs. And I think that our heart and our emotions are the thing that Satan attacks us with most. You know, if, if he gets in and causes us to doubt God um, or makes us feel that we have a lack of worth, maybe, or we're discouraged, um, you know, if we're down in heart it can cause us to fall away. And we've probably all been in positions where we could have done that. But God's righteousness protects our heart. If we stand with Jesus in the righteousness of God, it protects our vital organs, our spiritual vital organs, if you like. It covers us, covers us completely. We are protected. God protects us. You wouldn't throw yourself off of a crane to do a bungee jump without that cord attached to your ankles, would you? I think spiritually, we don't protect ourselves. How many of you consciously put on the armor of God every morning? I don't. If things go wrong, I might think about it. But very often, it's not until you know, we find ourselves in a difficult situation that we go back to basics and start to think about how we can reconnect with God and where the protection really is and where our strength comes from. So then we have our footgear, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And I pondered this quite a while because it's quite difficult to be eager for the gospel in today's society. You know, how many of us would like to run into Berry Park and, you know, preach the gospel? No takers? <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. It, it, it fills us all with a certain sense of, doesn't it? Maybe if someone questions us, and sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where people say, why do you believe what you believe? And we can share, and that's okay, because someone's given us an invitation to do that, so we're okay then. But to actually talk to somebody who doesn't know Jesus and share the love of God fills us with all sorts of fear, and fear doesn't come from God. But the interesting thing about Roman soldiers' footwear is that they used to drive nails through the soles of their shoes so that they could grip and stand firm. So whilst you might see strappy kind of sandaly things in the pictures, actually underneath are these spikes that are holding them firm. So when you think about that, think about standing firm. The first instruction is stand firm then. And you can do that with the root on the rock that we have that is Jesus. If we're standing on a firm foundation, Hell can't prevail against it. Jesus told us that. Running to shout it from the rooftops, the gospel, are we? It's another challenge for you. And then we come on to the shield of faith. Faith can help us in so many ways. It can give us comfort in dark days. It can protect us. We can um, find comfort and solace in faith. But sometimes actually holding on to faith can be difficult. It helps us extinguish the attacks of the enemy. Um, it helps us overcome. Faith is having God's perspective regardless of our circumstance. Again, we're standing on the rock. We are standing in truth. We are standing firm. And faith is something that is, you know, we believe in something that you can't see. You can't physically see it, but you can feel it and you can know it. The more you read scripture, the more you will understand what it is to have a relationship with, with the living God. But for each of us, that encounter is different. And if you're sitting here this morning thinking, well, I haven't had that yet, that's okay. Because just as uh, we had the analogy of uh, the, the duckling, the mother duckling, you know, God is there and he's encouraging us and he's coaxing us. He is not dragging us along like a two-year-old toddler, kicking and screaming. 
We may be rebellious sometimes. That's different. But we know we're being rebellious. But he's still, come on. Come on. Come with me. Because it's really exciting to be on this journey. It's not easy always. I doubt that anyone in this room became a Christian and found that all your problems went away. In fact, I think most times when we think that we're spiritually secure is when Satan attacks us the most. You may leave here today feeling up or down and immediately leave and feel exactly the opposite. The helmet of salvation. Our minds, how powerful are our minds? If you think of what a computer can do, if you think of what your smartphone can do, if you think of how an aeroplane flies, it is the human mind that has had all these concepts and created all of that. You know, groups of people, individuals. So how powerful is our mind and how important is it to protect our mind and what goes in what we read, what we watch on the television, what we believe. You can't pick up a newspaper or a magazine without being sold some sort of lie about you must have this, you must do that, you must look like this. I mean, even photos that you put on Facebook, I mean, how many people take a lovely scenery and then put a little filter on it so it looks better? Yeah? Am I the only one that does that? Okay, thanks, Jill. You know, we, we like to enhance things, we like to change things, but, you know, the truth is the truth, you know. So if you look at my Facebook page, yeah, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> no, that cake was that big. It really was that big. It was huge. That's a private joke, but yeah, it was. It's really important, as I say, that we protect ourselves spiritually. Yesterday, um, we were driving to Bedford, Jim was running a golf day for Sierra Leone to raise funds. And we were going up the A6. We hit a roundabout. The car that was going to pull out stopped. The man on a bike didn't. The man on a bike had no helmet, no elbow pads, no knee pads, no nothing. He just went in front of the car. Two seconds later, he probably wouldn't have made it, if I'm honest. He was wearing shorts and a t-shirt. He was not a kid. He was a grown man. And he just went for it. How many of us do that spiritually? How many of us are winging it? How many of us are in danger of believing a lie? How many of us are thinking, well, it's okay to do that? It's just a white lie. It's not, you know, it's not that bad. It's only a little sin. Everyone does that, don't they? In the whole armor of God, there's only one offensive weapon. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. This is your weapon. This is all we need. It's all in here. Guidance on everything is in here. We may interpret it differently. We may disagree on some points, but the fundamentals we all agree on are in here. The only thing we need to deceit, defeat Satan is the word of God. If you remember after Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan and sent into the wilderness, every attack, every lie, every temptation he faced, he fought with the word of God. We can do the same. He counted everything with scripture. There's power and truth. We're back to truth in the word but I think much as you can read the armor of God as an individual instruction one soldier on their own cannot defeat an army which is why when soldiers go into battle they go in together which is why the Roman soldiers had those huge shields so that when they advanced, much like you see riot police perhaps on the streets of London or Belfast or around the world, go as a wall linked together. There is strength in numbers. 
We can't do it always on our own. We can protect ourselves daily. We can put on our armor of God. But sometimes we just need people to say, come on, we need to take that role. Let's do this together. We've got this. We are the body of Christ. I'm not the finger and Vicky is the foot. We are collectively the body of Christ. That is so important. We're not meant to be individuals fighting on our own. We're meant to come together. We're not always going to get on. We're not always going to agree. But we are the body of Christ. We're as flawed as Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and all of those people in the Bible, the great heroes of our faith. When we read their stories, they're as screwed up as we are. I get great comfort from that. They made some huge mistakes, massive. But they stayed in contact with God. The other weapon we have, or the other protection we have, of course, is to pray. We can do that individually. We can do that collectively. And I know that there are sessions of corporate prayer here. I'm not sure how many people came on Tuesday. But we need to come together as the body and pray. There is strength in numbers. Together we're stronger. If we were all thrown off a boat and a shark was coming, it'd be no good us floating around as little individuals. We would have to come together to stand a chance of surviving. And we have to do that as a church. We have to be united. We are quality. We are quality street. We are all those different flavors, all those different shapes and sizes, and we have different personalities. But God has created us that way. He's made us unique. He's made us exactly that because that's who he wants us to be, to complement each other, to sharpen each other, you know, knock off the sharp edges maybe, but to come together as one body, united as a quality body of Christ for him. And that really is awesome. So let's not forget. Let's consciously put on our armor of God. Let's use the one weapon we have. Let's really connect as much as we can with the word. I know I don't do it enough, but when I do it, everything looks different. The perspective is different. When you look at things from God's perspective, it's different. Power and truth in the word. I'd just like to finish with the final verse that um, we had from John today which was chapter 6 verse 69 and this comes straight after Simon Peter has said to him Lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus is the answer, regardless of the question. Thank you.